welcome back, everyone. We're here live in San Francisco for the Red Hat Summit. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. Now we're going to get some experts to talk about the cloud and government. Uh, Nirma Mehta, a cloud engineer, strategic innovations group at Booz Allen, and uh, Jared Cottrell, uh, engineer at Booz Allen. Welcome to the Cube. Thank you. So, guys, talk about um, obviously government. Government 2.0 has been discussed going back. It's been played out, but the reality is, is that the government has been an adopter of all new technology. I interviewed some guys back in the day on, uh, who built the, the, the first big data platform from scratch, the Squirrel founders, and you know, back then there was, there was no Hadoop, so they had to build their own. So the government's always pushing the envelope on, on stuff, and it has to be turnkey. So I got to first ask you guys, um, uh, Jerry, we'll start with you. Sure. Cl cloud adoption in the government, where, where are we? Share with the folks who aren't paying attention to the government space. Uh, are they deep in the cloud? <laughs> Is it just a throwaway? Yeah, yeah. Is it a, they so, kicking the tires? So it, it depends. I know people don't <laughs> like to hear that, but it, it really does. So I think, you know, there there's a lot, there's a lot of organizations in the government. It's a, it's a big group of people, and I think we're finding they're all at different maturity levels. You know, some are you know, seriously still just in the strategy part of their cycle. Some are doing proof of concepts. Some are actually implementing cloud public, private, hybrid, what have you. So we're in the mix of all that. Uh, other folks are even farther than that. They're looking at cloud management, cloud brokering. That's really where we're starting to see a lot of interest, a lot of growth. And uh, you know, it really just depends on where they're at and their budget cycles and so what's the what big risk driver? they're willing to take. So what's the big driver? Obviously the cloud is economic benefits. We're seeing Amazon, it's really been a forcing function for many. It's been, the, it's been that, that tide that's been coming in and, and, and taking some territory down, certainly in the enterprise, and, and I'm not sure about the government, but it really forces the people to say, hey, okay, cloud has some benefits, but you can't just plug it into a public cloud because there are some security issues, other legacy issues. Sure. Uh, the government certainly has a lot of legacy. So how do you guys uh, talk about that, and how do you guys identify the disruptors in the emerging sector? How do you balance the two? So some folks think virtualization is in the cloud, so that's the first thing, is helping them understand what cloud really is, right? And I think a lot of the drivers end up being around money, obviously, but what comes with that is the automation, right? So they have a lot of back-end manual processes that we're trying to fix. And them as well, and I think cloud really benefits a lot of that, whether it's public or private, right? Um, I think in general, another big driver, and I think this is where cloud management brokering comes in, is you know, we're, there, there's a new workforce out there, right? There's new buying patterns, there's new consuming patterns. A lot like us and mobile phones now, it's just changed our lives. I think that's starting to get into the enterprise and we're going to see a lot of procurements around that kind of thing. So they get, so, so two things, the trends of sure. hey, consumerization is happening and with the cost pressure, right. uh, but also um, is there a development focus? Do so they say, hey, we want to, we have developers, do we want to add on to, what's, what's the developer impact in the, in the government sector? Well, I think it's even a lot like New Zealand, right? We, we develop applications, we have developers that work with clients to do different things. You know, we, they, they want them to focus like a data scientist, right? You don't want a data scientist working on infrastructure, right? Your application goes down. They should not be spending their time working with Amazon, building the servers and all that. So I think that's where a lot of the cloud comes in the platform as a service, especially some of the open shift stuff that my friend Normal here is working on. Um, absolutely, right, it's about the efficiencies and getting it quick and having them focus on what their role is. Before we talk about some of the procurement disruptions, because certainly Amazon's uh, lawsuit against Intel was very uh, telling, we covered that on theCUBE. Norm, I want to first go into the tech side, talk about some of the, so what's going on under the hood, right? It's yeah, a lot absolutely. of interesting new dynamics around automation and orchestration seem to be the hot areas. Could you give us an update on where you, where you, where you think that market is? Absolutely, so um, last year we won the Red Hat Innovation Award for uh, combining uh, JBoss rules engine with JBPM, and uh, Fuse to automate the underlying infrastructure as a service. And since that point, I mean, four or five years ago when we started doing this, elasticity orchestration was still very manual and no one was at that point. Now, putting business rules in, um, automating workflows is just accelerating tremendously. The space is really ripe for uh, an open standards-based view of how to create application stacks, create environments that are standardized and be, being able to be deployed in multiple environments at the same time. So interoperability, migration, ease of deployment of code is definitely where things are going right now. Under, underneath the hood, um, there's a huge race right now between different containerization platforms, OpenShift, Docker, uh, there's Cloud Foundry, all these other uh, you know, vApps, things like that. And, um, 
it's just it's a very really exciting time actually because finally we're getting to the point where the the gap between your developers and the infrastructure and your production code is becoming smaller and smaller and uh, really we're trying to, starting to actually see the benefits of where cloud is supposed to be. Talk about the customer use case. Let's walk through something. So I'm a customer. I have a lot of Red Hat. I've been working with Red Hat. Red Hat has a lot of presence. I might have some NetApp drives and some EMC drives, a lot of legacy stuff. Now some boom, I got to go to the cloud. Cloud is enticing, it's intoxicating, it's, it gets your attention, right, at many levels. But then the reality is, oh, how do I get there, right? So it's like, <laughs> I, I want to service the Red Hat component. I have hardware. Maybe there's different configurations on the software side. You know, assuming SDN, all this stuff gets taken care of, but I'm a CIO, I'm a practitioner, I got to get this to market. What are some of the critical challenges and, and opportunities that, and, and technical points that they have to think about to go from, oh, I have a Red Hat, maybe some vendors servicing it, maybe Booz Allen servicing it, maybe another vendor's doing the services, but I got Red Hat, where do I go to the cloud? Right, so now Red Hat has lots of different options in terms of cloud service providers. There's Amazon, there's uh, Microsoft Azure, there's, um, what, the recent announcement of Google uh, Cloud Platform, being able to put your Red Hat subscriptions there. So there's lots of places where you can put those RHEL licenses, or entitlements, if you will. However, I think uh, what we're really seeing is our customers want to put something on, on top of that first, and that's the cloud bar brokering platform. So what we're building out and what we're seeing our customers demand is a way for their internal customers, their developers, their operations teams, to be able to provision their systems to whatever cloud platform, whether it's internal, external, legacy, uh, PaaS, SaaS services, and be able to understand the exact costs for each of those options and make the best decision based on the needs at that time. Um, that, over time, will allow their internal customers to migrate and start adopting greenfield projects in new cloud environments. Okay, I got to ask you, the reality of OpenStack, okay, a lot of people saying, I love OpenStack, I can look under the hood, Lego blocks, composite application, all, all that stuff goes on and on. It's a great conversation. However, the reality is OpenStack is emerging. A lot of folks in the use case I mentioned like OpenStack because they can look under the hood. They're not necessarily up to date on where it is and its life cycle. So where are we with OpenStack? How viable is OpenStack today? And where are we on that vision? Because it is appealing to those folks who have these environments. They see OpenStack as kind of like Amazon, but I could get some customization. So can you share your opinion on that? Yeah, sure. So a couple years ago, um, we started looking at OpenStack and no one was really talking about it. It was still very new, um, very beta, if you will, software. Uh, a lot of our customers weren't even looking at it. Um, we were just starting to look at it. And there was still some shakiness about what direction the industry is going, CloudStack, OpenStack, what flavors. Um, all of a sudden in the last, I'd say about four or five months, it has just blown up. Um, I think that's because, and th this is just response from the market, OpenStack is finally at the point where it's production ready, it's vetted, our customers are more familiar with it, and it there's can, production only deployment can, examples out there. There's absolutely, but um, you know, the bigger the customer base, the bigger the production area, the better, right? And so I think we're at this turning point right now. 2014 is definitely going to be a year of OpenStack in that sense. Um, we see a lot of our clients coming up to us, asking for it, asking for information about it, uh, figuring out what the support models are for it, um, what flavors work for their environment. So. Uh, I Certainly Red Hat's got a huge opportunity today. with open source. I mean, obviously a lot of people are trying to you know, you know, block them into, into the wall, if Absolutely. you will, to use our NASCAR example. Uh, everyone's got their wheels on their, on their cars, they're speeding down in, in the race right now. Uh, Jerry, I want to get your perspective on it. Um, is Red Hat at risk? I mean, you got others out there kind of trying to bump them around. What do they need to do to, to, to I, win I, them? I think their model, their model works how it is, right? They support the community, they, they become the big name. Um, just to add to normal, so a lot of our clients, you know, they, they get a little little shaky when you say open source, but with a name like Red Hat behind it, let's not discredit that, right? Now there's a there's a trusted name, there's support behind the product. I think that perspective, especially in the federal government, we're going to see a lot of adoption. Um, we saw that with RHEL, what they did with Linux. I think we're going to see that same thing with OpenStack. To me, that was the that's the biggest hump to get over. We're going to start to see OpenStack on the uh, approved product list of all these agencies. Yeah. They can't use it unless it's on that list. 
So we're, we're really moving in the right direction. Well, I mean, I, I always get this question all the time, hey, what's, is Red Hat blowing it in OpenStack? And I say, hey, now, if you look at the contributor list, I mean, they're not like in the last place. They're up in the top, if not sure. num number one. Um, so that one, they're contributing a lot to OpenStack. Two, their brand value in, mm -hmm. inside enterprise and government is massive. I mean, it's not like they're a bit player mm -hmm. at all. I mean, they're pretty solid. So if you look at the competition, <laughs> They're jockeying for that those brand that brand value. They don't actually have the same as Red Hat. So Red Hat has a huge opportunity right now, I think, to be the leader of the community. Do you think that they're doing that right now, uh, being the leader? Um, could they be doing more? Because they're kind of a humble company. I mean, they're not. They don't do a lot of grandstanding. But uh, are they in a good spot, guys? And what, if not, or what could they do better? Yeah. So I think this is where. Booz Allen as a you know a system integrator and a partner comes into play. We we not only look at open uh, open source technologies and what Red Hat provides, but put together the use cases and the, the architectures and the deployment models that will work for our clients, and really vet it and put a big check mark on it, saying yes, this will work for you. And I think um, yes, Red Hat is kind of humble, um, but. They are a recognized name within the open source industry. Um, they basically represent open source to anyone that on the street that doesn't know what open source is. And uh, in the long run, uh, they have a very good reputation in terms of supporting new in innovations and new technologies and, and their own communities first. And I think that's a really powerful message that we can bring to our clients for long-term stability and uh, innovation in the future. Jerry, talk about the pro procurement cycle. We I mentioned earlier, I kind of teased out the Amazon IBM thing, which is kind of a way the lawsuit around the bid, but to be more general, cloud has changed the cycles of procurement, right? It changes the implementation um, time to value. Sure. So the old days, <laughs> when we was, I was uh, just getting into the business, I mean, the, the rollouts were massive, you know, year, maybe two years, <laughs> massive deployment cycles. Now you're seeing acceleration. What does the current deployment cycles look like? What Give us a taste of, what is it? What is it like? I mean, so so the biggest challenge right now is, especially in the federal government, is how do you buy that stuff, right? Because it's not a typical, you know, pay for use using the cloud. They don't have credit cards. Uh, you know, that's really the big hurdle. So not a lot of shadow IT in the government, is there? And, and there's yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that's one of the drivers for a CIO to to, to, to broker cloud to their yeah. organizations, right? Um, but the key thing is is around you know how do we how, how do they buy it? So yeah. that makes the procurement cycle. A lot longer. So we've actually been following quite a few, like a you know storage as a service, infrastructure as a service, what have you. Um, those procurements just keep getting delayed. I think you guys could be the shadow IT organization for the government. <laughs> they have to and, uh, you bring it in house. <laughs> so you know, I think like like most big procurements, because what we're seeing is these large agencies. These are really big procurements. These are three, four, yeah. five, six hundred million dollar procurements. It's going to take a couple years to get those out. A lot of engineering as well. It's the requirements, right? How do we, all the different cloud providers, uh, you know, license a little bit different, their cost models are a little bit different. So until those become some sort of standard, I think we're still looking at another one or two years until we see really big adoption. Yeah. Well, you Because know, of that, there's a huge well, process. The Obamacare website going down certainly puts, <laughs> a, puts a face sure. to the uh, average consumer out there who might not be in the weeds. So what do you guys say to, I mean, I don't want to get into that particular use case, but you know, that kind of makes the government look like they don't know what they're doing in terms of technology. <laughs> uh, so how do you guys uh, help the, the government kind of get, get faster and more relevant there? Not necessarily that website, but in general for tech. What do you, what are you guys do as a firm? So a lot of it is just, um, you know, by nature of being a consulting firm, we have a lot of clients, a lot of lessons learned. So we try and share that, right? We try and replicate how other folks are doing it. So we do have commercial practice. So we share a lot of that. We help, you know, push them towards some of these new procurement models. You know, granted, you can't change the government procurement model, but there are, you know, ways that you can, uh, you know, work around and, and do different kinds of uh, approaches. So, you know, a lot of it is just as a, as a firm, um, you know, again, sharing lessons learned, helping them helping them drive to, to different ways to procure. Um, the technology is not always the, the hard part. It's there. We know it works to some extent. So Padma, how you integrate it, how you put the pieces together. Really so Padma works. Warrior was saying in her keynote this morning from Cisco that uh, with SaaS exposes things like these little scabs and the, like a website example. Um, Highlights it versus you know if it's you know if it's a software out of the box, but that's so that's what kind of an interesting anecdote. But more importantly, she said um, people would be buying outcomes, guaranteeing SLA around outcomes. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, you guys are on, on the front lines. Is that reality? Is that is that fiction? Is that soon to be? Uh, 
10 years out, or is that just vision? What, what's your take on that? Um, well, internally within the government, SLAs um, tend to be a lot trickier because the business drivers are a lot different. Um, the incentives are a lot different. Uh, it's, it's not profit that drives things and reducing costs. It's oftentimes ensuring services and maintaining mission criticality. Um, so we see a, a cloud as a, and procurement of cloud services as a way to kind of reintroduce good SLAs back into um, the procurement models. And as more and more of these uh, systems that we integrate with become services, um, those procurement models will reflect that. And those inherently come with those service level agreements. So um, hopefully this will be a big driver to ensure good, uh, consistent uh, agreements between internal customers and the providers of those services. So I think who, who owns SLA will be key too. Yeah. I, literally all of our clients, all of our major government clients, they're, they're asking themselves, they're either gonna become a broker themselves to these different cloud providers, the top provider owns SLA, or they're gonna go to a third party, maybe like Booz Allen or, or someone else where they go and just buy those services, we own the SLA and we're responsible for that. So I think you're gonna see those two paths sort of come together at some point. Yeah. Guys, great stuff here. Love talking about what's in the front lines and the trenches around cloud, certainly in the government sector. We don't get a lot of that on theCUBE, which is mostly private, but uh, you know, their, their business too, government, is, is getting a consumerization uh, trend hitting them in, right, in the, right in the face. So, so uh, that's great. But I want to ask a final question to summarize out for the folks watching. What's this show all about? I mean, obviously you got IBM here for 10 years, Cisco just showing up for the first time, open source on its, you know, some argue sixth generation, fourth generation, uh, the commercialization open source is not stopping. That, that train is like barreling down the tracks. Why is this show so important right now at this point in time? I think for us, especially from a cloud perspective, you know, if you look at what cloud, you know, what the promise is around being open, being flexible, you know, different kinds of services, being able to move around. It, without open source, it's, cloud's probably not going to be successful, is, is at least is what it's promised to be. I think yeah. that's what this show is all about to me. I Never see it as a, as a platform. This show is about seeing where the industry will be in terms of seeing the communities, what they're working on, what problems and features they're working on, and seeing where our clients will be and, and really being able to engage with the direct people that innovate at the edge. And that is so crucial. A lot of other places, other conferences, you don't get that opportunity, and that's yeah. what the show is about. And also we were talking with Cisco earlier, software engineering driving the bus here, you know, and it really is about the innovation around DevOps, and, uh -huh. and you're seeing Internet of Things being impacted by software engineering, software architecture with virtualization completely changes the game. I mean, it's just like, and that wasn't like that 10 years ago. You know, you wrote your apps, you deployed it, you stacked up some gear, now everyone's pretty much a software guy. You know, another yeah. big word I think we'll start seeing over the next year is no ops, right? So the automation's going <laughs> to be- A lot of companies have a lot of those guys. So, <laughs> is that a right? title or is that a trend? Just, just no ops, right? All automated, right? The digital enterprise, if you will. Yeah, yeah. He's a no op, he's a DBA. Uh, <laughs> no, it's actually, actually going to be a really hot oh. job. Yeah. Um, we actually interviewed the guy from the San Francisco Giants, the CIO here in San Francisco. Um, great interview, and they all get World Series rings. And the favorite quote was, even the DBAs get a World Series ring. Everyone in the company gets yeah. a, a World Series ring. So, um, you know, we're, we, we, we see that, that being huge. Guys, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. We're stuck on time here. Uh, Red Hat, really the bellwether. We have Intel, we had Cisco on. Uh, software, DevOps, cloud is really making a uh, real dent. Open source is, is, is driving it all. Thanks so much for your comments. We'll be right Thank back you. after this short break. Thanks. Thank you.